Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club event. My name is Adam Becker. I'm an astrophysicist and also a science writer and communication specialist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and your moderator for today. Before we get started, we would like to thank Wonderfest for partnering on today's program with us. It's my pleasure to introduce Michael Dine, Distinguished Professor of Physics at the Santa Cruz Institute for Particle Physics, University of California, Santa Cruz, and author of the new book, this Way to the Universe, A Theoretical Physicist's Journey to the Edge of Reality. Professor Dine is a world-renowned physicist who is recognized for his contributions to our understanding of particle physics and string theory. His book is a spellbinding journey to the bounds of the universe that covers the most fascinating curiosities of physics right now, including the Big Bang, dark matter, and the Higgs boson particle. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour, and I want to ask Professor Dine your questions. If you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube, and we'll be getting to them later in the program. Professor Dine, welcome. Thank you. It's pleased to be here. Great. Let me start by asking you, this is your first book for a wide audience, right? Yes. So what prompted you to write this book now, and what prompted you to write this book on this subject? Well, I think what... What, what got me thinking of that book was the discovery of the Higgs particle in 2012. Uh, and sort of the realization that we have achieved a level of understanding of nature, both on very small scales, very tiny things, things smaller than atomic nuclei, and on very large scales, scales of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, the universe as a whole, and conceivably beyond. And so there are lots of things we understand really well and I wanted partly to convey that. At the same time, I wanted to sort of say that there are things we don't understand and kind of list what are the big, what are the big mysteries? Uh, and, what are, and, and also, what, are the, what, are, what is the likelihood that we will answer some of these questions we have with experiments, with theory, and kind of give some picture of what, that, what that's about. So what are those big mysteries? What's, uh, what's waiting out there? Well, on the cosmic scale, uh, there, are, there are several. Uh, so one of the things we, we do understand remarkably well is what the universe is made of. So we know that about 5% is ordinary stuff, uh, dark, uh, I'm sorry, protons, neutrons, things of that sort. And then about 25% is something else that we call dark matter. And we know that it's there. We know that it's there because of its gravitational effects, its gravitational pull, but we don't know what it is. And another 70% or so is something called dark energy. And this is probably Einstein's cosmological constant, something he introduced early on and then discarded, calling it the greatest mistake of his life. But it's, it's really there and it's really bizarre. It is, uh, the mystery there is why is it just the right amount right now that in this epoch in the universe, this time point in time, give or take a billion years or so, uh, that uh, it's becoming important and taking over. So it's really taking over. It, uh, it will become more and more important as the universe evolves. So, there, so those are two very big mysteries. On a more microscopic scale, there are lots of questions we have. Uh, there are interesting questions which have been resolved, especially recently by the Large Hadron Collider program and programs elsewhere. But there are, uh, but there are great mysteries we have. The Higgs particle, uh, as heavy as it is and as hard as it was to produce, is remarkably light from the perspective of our theoretical prejudices. And understanding that is a big mystery. And then there are other questions. There are questions about general relativity and quantum mechanics. Uh, and things like string theory, 
where the, and really there we get into questions of where do the laws of nature come from? And these are things about which we have constructive but not complete thoughts. And that's sort of what I wanted to communicate. Interesting. So what, what are those thoughts? Like what, what's, the, what's the latest thinking on say dark matter? So, so dark matter is, uh, uh, I, I devote a chapter to it in fact. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, uh, and there are various ideas about it. So, so, so when for a number of years, uh, it seemed that we had a really good compelling candidate. Something which was particles which were called WIPs stands for weakly interacting massive particles. And these particles were predicted by a particularly popular set of ideas in particle physics known, known as supersymmetry. And, and sort of beautifully, these theories predicted basically just about the amount of dark matter we see. But we've been hunting for this, we collectively, uh, especially uh, several very beautiful and uh, remarkable experiments, hunting for this dark matter now for, for, for decades and not found it. And in fact, sort of ruled out many of the simple possibilities, the simplest possibilities that we have. So uh, there's another possibility that I'm fond of and that I've worked on, which is something called the axiom. The name derives from the name of a detergent, which involved a brief period of popularity, I believe in the 70s, 1970s. Uh, but um, it's, it is actually a rather compelling uh, object which emerges from other theoretical considerations, uh, something we've been thinking about for a long time. It's hard to discover if it's there, but there is uh, a, a very impressive experiment at the University of Washington known as ADMX, which is looking for it. Uh, and, um, uh, but it might not be where they're looking. And that's another question that keeps me up nights and that I talk about. Uh, but finally, what's happened with the, with the, the way a direct, the field has sort of shifted direction in this and that with the, with the exclusion of some of these simpler ideas, uh, people are looking at uh, more general possibilities. The stuff is there, uh, it's gotta be something and sort of categorizing all the things that might be effectively and thinking how you search for it in different regimes. That's, uh, that's sort of, that's where, where that, that story is right now. So you have actually a lot, it's actually interesting, a lot of theorists have turned into experimentalists and joined experimental collaborations and proposed experiments to become experts on subtle uh, condensed matter effects uh, in detectors. So um, for detectors that might see these particles. So, uh, so there's quite a, a remarkable set of developments there. Fantastic. Okay. So actually I wanna, I wanna just switch gears for a sure. moment. Um, so toward the beginning of your book, you talk about an important carpooling experience. <laughs> yeah. And uh, maybe that's actually, it is sort of related to what you were just saying about theorists becoming experimentalists and, and coming up with experimental ideas. Can you tell us a little bit more about that carpool and why it was important? Yes, well, when I moved to Santa Cruz uh, some time ago, uh, I, uh, I, I, I'm in a household where you know, both of us, both my spouse and I work and we, uh, and her, her position was in Silicon Valley, which is about a 45 minute drive door to door from UC Santa Cruz. And for various reasons, we really needed to live near her, near her work. So I commuted. Now, what's interesting is that I almost, I immediately found a group of colleagues to carpool with. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was good on several counts. There were, they, we all, be, we became close friends, uh, quite, quite close friends. It was, very, it was very stimulating carpool. I'll describe a little bit who was in this carpool in a moment. Uh, and, uh, and also, it, you know, I felt better about my environmental footprint driving typically with four or five other people every day. Uh, so, um, so in this carpool uh, were uh, three people who had, uh, 
who, three high energy experimental physicists. Okay. And they lived where on my side of the hill because at, when they originally come to Santa Cruz, they were involved in, in experiments at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in Palo Alto. And so they wanted to be sort of in between or close to the accelerator to run their experiments. That wasn't necessarily their portfolio at the time, but that was you know, where they'd established their families and you know, acquired places to live and so on. So there was this group. Uh, and then there were uh, two astronomers, uh, one George Blumenthal, who, who among, with other colleagues at Santa Cruz was among the theorists who worked out the theory of dark matter and later became the chancellor of UC Santa Cruz. Uh, and another Doug Lin, who was uh, uh, an astronomer interested in, uh, in, in planetary theory. Uh, and so we had quite a, quite, quite a, uh, a, a diverse group. And of course, you know, in a, in a carpool like that, you know, a lot of what you talk about is, uh, you know, com your children and your, uh, your spouse and your, the problems with your home repairs. But, we, but, but the, level, the level of scientific discussion was quite, was quite high and quite interesting and, and sort of kept me on my toes. I mean, we all had to explain to each other what it is we were doing and what was occupying us at any given moment. So when people ask you what you're doing, how do you, how do you answer? How do you explain what you work on? Oh, well, that of course varies in different contexts. So if I'm talking to a high energy experimentalist, uh, then or, you know, someone who works in an accelerator, I have to justify myself in the sense of what is, the, what, is, what, is what I'm doing, how is what I'm doing related to things that they might study in experiments or may, may observe. So the pressure is so the pressure is sort of in, in that direction. In talking to you know to my community, larger community, it's it's a little different. Uh, and they're there we try and explain, for example, you know, in recent years, the Higgs boson. Why is that? Why is that interesting? What is that telling us? Uh, what's involved in, in in observing it? And it's really uh, it's really quite remarkable. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, what. Uh, and, and of course, in a little what I do like to do is I like to advertise also my colleagues in UC Santa Cruz, uh, where uh, a lot of beautiful things have happened. I mean, like for example, in the area of planetary formation, certainly Berkeley, where you are, has been a planetary, I'm sorry, extrasolar planets. Uh, uh, Berkeley, where you are, has been a center for this, but Santa Cruz has been a major center for development of instruments and for this the whole program of uh, isolating uh, of discovering and isolating these objects. So. Yeah, absolutely. So you were saying the Higgs boson is remarkable. What's remarkable about the Higgs boson? Well, I was actually thinking partly that it's, it, it partly that, well, I'll start with what's remarkable and, and really surprising and certainly took me by surprise, went against a lot of prejudices mm -hmm. um, that I had. And that's uh, that it is, it, it, if you take the standard model, so we have this, we have this, uh, this theory which describes the interactions which we readily study in experiments, the, the strong nuclear force, the weak interaction which is responsible for a phenomena like beta decay, very important for processes in stars, as is the strong interactions, uh, and the electromagnetic interaction which uh, describes the force between charged objects, it's the thing which holds atoms and molecules together, for example, and, you know, uh, controls along with the fourth force, gravity, you know, our day-to-day -day existence. Uh, so, uh, and the Higgs particle, and, and when, uh, when Weinberg and Salam, Weinberg sadly passed away just recently, but when Weinberg and Salam put this model forward, you could ask, there, there, was, there was something else they needed. So they had a, they had a theory, which I, which I explained a little bit the background to, uh, and, and they put together various pieces, but they needed something to understand the, the masses of certain particles, in particular, the masses of the particles which mediate the weak force. So these are known as the W and C. And to explain that, there was a, there's a sort of simplest possibility. And that simplest possibility is fine, but why it should be that way is not at all clear. And, and through the years, a lot of us have had lots of very uh, elaborate arguments about what that, what 
really should be there. It really shouldn't be that simple. The fact that it is simple, it is a, that, that in fact we've discovered that it is basically as, it, I mean, this is still something that we're exploring, but the evidence is pretty strong that it is really the simplest Higgs particle. Uh, that is, uh, that's surprising. That's really interesting. The, uh, it's one of the things that keeps a lot of us up, up at night. Now, uh, the other aspect of this that's remarkable is just the discovery itself. Uh, and I, you know, I advertised Santa Cruz again, my colleague Howard Haber, along with uh, several others, actually wrote a book about the whole question of discovering the Higgs, uh, the Higgs particle. Uh, around the time, actually, I arrived at Santa Cruz, called the Higgs Hunter's Guide. If any of you remember years ago, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it was a play on that, on that title. The, uh, but uh, this is not an easy particle to see. It basically, because it, it, it participates, the weak interactions are called the weak interactions for the rather dumb reason that they're weak. Okay, so the strength of the force is, is small and it makes it hard to see this particle. It makes it hard to produce this particle and it makes it very hard to detect it when you produce it. So, uh, so, so the strategies, some of the strategies for doing this were outlined in this book and outlined by others. Uh, and, uh, and the actual discovery was really quite spectacular. So what people saw was the Higgs particle. So the Higgs particle is, I should say, extremely unstable. So when you produce it, it lives for something like 10 to the minus 33 seconds, something like a, a, tri a, a trillion, let's see, what's that? A, a billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. So it, that's, that's its half-life, if you like, as a radioactive particle, give or take a factor of 10. The, uh, so so the, way, the way in which you see this thing is, 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 how, is through the way it decays. And, and it's just spectacular. The, only, the, the, the first handle one had on this in the experiment was the decay of the Higgs to two very high energy gamma rays. Uh, this is actually not its favorite way to decay, but it's the, it's the way that stands out that one can detect. And one saw this really beautiful signal uh, sort of early on in 2012. In fact, the announcement was made on July 4th, 2012. Uh, and uh, uh, and, uh, and this, this is remarkable. And, the, and, and what's been able, what people have been able to do subsequently uh, in this program, the Large Hadron Collider is remarkable also. So they have now looked at several other uh, decay chains for this particle uh, and, uh, and, and established that they do, they do conform to the expectations of the standard model. And I should say the, the, the calculations that go into this are also quite spectacular. So on the theoretical side, for example, uh, there are calculations of the production of the Higgs, which, uh, which are really a tour de force, which really people have developed methods uh, over the last two decades, which are uh, quite powerful to do what previously would have been, uh, in, you know, essentially intractable calculations, just involving too much computer effort to, to really do. And people have made enormous progress in this area. So there are a whole set of things associated with the Higgs particle, which are, which are quite beautiful and remarkable. Fantastic. So in your book, you talk a lot about the sort of history of everything that you were just outlining, you know, the history of yeah. the discovery of the different forces and the discovery that some of them were sort of connected or the same force in different guises like electricity and magnetism or, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the work that you were talking about by Weinberg and Salam with the electro weak force. Um, and, and that motivated the, the search for the Higgs, right? Yes. Yeah. But the, now that the Higgs has been found, there's, there's a term that's been floating around in the, in the physics and the science journalism community about, uh, the situation that particle physics is in now with, um, finding the Higgs at the LHC, but not finding anything else, right? And this is, this is called the nightmare scenario. Yeah, uh, yes. So I, I, I would say 
uh, certainly we've been surprised and disappointed. And I probably should explain exactly what that's about and the nature of this and the nature and, and where I think, and, and, and this sort of obligates me to talk a little bit about where, where we might be headed. Yeah. So, um, so I said that the, the fact that Higgs is so simple is, is a surprise. And, and I talk about uh, a little more in the book than I can detail here uh, now about, about why. But, and, but what I said is it's surprising that the Higgs is, is, is light. And this is related to the fact that, uh, well, I, I, I should tell a story. So, so uh, why, why, why do we, the electron is, a, is, is very light. The electron is, uh, is uh, more than a thousand times lighter, than, so about 2000 times lighter than the proton, for example. And it's and then that mass is very important. I mean, the the you know, all, most of our technology, a good deal of our existence, is contingent on this lightness of the electron. Chemist, the way chemistry works, the way. So, uh, and you could, and, but and you could ask, is it a surprise? What should that mass be? Uh, and and I should back up and I should say, I don't think I tell this story in the book, but you know, when we when we when we study. Uh, our early high school or early college years, we study chemistry and physics and other things. And you know, there there are these numbers in the back of the book, uh, which you look up. You know, the mass of this or that particle, or this or that entity, or the or the the charge of a particle. Okay, and there's a sort of question of, you know, well, where do those things come from? Should we be able to understand them? And I should pause and say there's a story that people uh, used to tell about Wolf. Uh, Wolfgang Pauli, who was known as a, a as very critical, and and uh, and so in the story, he 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 dies, he goes to heaven. God says, "I'll you, you I'll reward you with an answer of one question, <laughs> one question which bothers you." And he asks basically, "What is the?" Uh, he doesn't phrase it quite this way, but he basically asks, "Why does the charge? Why is the charge of the electron the value it is?" And so in the story, God goes to a blackboard and starts to explain. And at some point, Wolfgang Pauli, who was again known as this critic, shakes his head and says, no, that's not right. <laughs> but, uh, but, but these are things we would like to understand. And the electron in particular, the mass of the electron at first sight, if, it, again, as a, as a, a first year graduate student encounters this in, 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 in physics, is somewhat surprising because the electron is surrounded by this electric field. Okay, that's what gives rise to the force. And the electric field stores energy. And Einstein tells you that mass is energy, energy is mass. So that field should contribute to the mass of the electron. And if you then ask how, how much should it contribute, the answer is a huge amount, okay? or at least at first sight. The way you would learn it in your in your in your first graduate course, and this is a, a question that actually uh, people explored already in the early days of quantum mechanics. And notoriously, uh, as I explained, there, were, there was a mistake in one of these calculations, and so on, and which sort of gave that answer. But it turns out that quantum mechanics, which you've written about and know much about, is uh, it tells you something different. It tell it it it. it the, the naive guess for how much mass there is is, is wrong, and, there's re and it's really quite small. So everything's okay. Everything's sort of hunky-dory. You can understand why the electron is lighter than the other particles. Okay, that's not, that doesn't puzzle you. The Higgs particle is different. The Higgs particle also has these fields around it, but it turns out they make a really big contribution to the mass. So something really weird has to go on, okay, to cancel off that calculation, that contribution. Uh, getting back to this uh, kind of God cartoon sort of imagery. Uh, when I first was learned about this puzzle, I had this picture of, of you know, of this all of this omnipotent being having to adjust the dials to make sure that nature came out all right and adjust them really, really carefully with many, many digits. Okay, something like 32 digits. In order to get things to come out right, so this was this uh, 
so so this is a is is a great mystery, and this has led to various proposals. So resolving this, so the, so the most promising is this thing called supersymmetry, or I say at least seem to be. I should be careful. And supersymmetry was this new symmetry of nature. It predicted new kinds of particles. It made it, it did two a couple of remarkable things. It explained some of the strength of some of the, the relative strength of certain forces, and it gave this dark matter candidate, which I mentioned earlier. So there was a lot of enthusiasm and optimism, and the expectation was that the, among, in, among many people that the Large Hadron Collider would discover this. Well, it didn't. And at this point, it's, it, it, you can't say it isn't there, but you can, you can say that the, that the particles that, uh, the, that the new particles which are predicted are heavier than expected if they're there at all. Uh, and actually a good deal heavier, a, a, tr a troubling amount heavier, not impossibly so. But, uh, and, and so this is, uh, and, and, and a number of other proposals, both to solve this problem and others, have also not been realized. And, you know, of course, this is also a, uh, a statement that experimentalists are careful and honest. Uh, you know, they would, they would love to discover some of these things. So what, so what could be going on? So there could be new phenomena around the corner. Uh, that's certainly a possibility. In fact, uh, if, if you believe in supersymmetry, given the mass of the Higgs particle, you actually would expect the supersymmetric particles, the new particles to be a little out of reach of the Large Hadron Collider. This is actually a result in part due to my, again, my colleague Howard Heber, who I mentioned uh, already some years ago. Uh, and so, uh, so, so people are thinking in a variety of directions about new phenomena right around the corner, about perhaps what you would, would see at the LHC, or you might have to wait to, for some future facility. So there are future large facilities under discussion in Europe and in China in particular. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly one direction. Uh, there's certainly a worry that, that this, though, that this is it, that we are, um, you know, and I, I should back up and I should say that, uh, in fact, this is, it motivates a lot of the interest in, in dark matter in part because it, it is something we know is there and we don't have an explanation for. But, uh, but, but, but certainly, uh, it's, uh, we worry that 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 we have uh, that we could be in, in in a regime we could be in a state where the answers to many of our questions are out of reach, and and this is indeed I'd say one of the motivations for for the book kind of trying to explain a little bit what the issues are, and uh, you know where we're uh, you know where where we might be headed. Hmm. So how did you end up going about writing the book? Uh, we were talking a little bit about this before we got started here. Um, uh, tell, me, tell me a little bit more about how you ended up writing the book. Okay, well, there are various parts of the story I don't want to tell because I'm, I'm afraid I would get sued or something. But, <laughs> someone, but I, I, I started thinking about this, in fact, sort of precisely because of this question, because at the point where the LHC had discovered the Higgs, and where it was starting to rule out a lot of other speculative ideas, uh, it seemed maybe it was time to kind of bring together a lot of the things we understand. Certainly a lot of things also, in, I should say, in cosmology and astrophysics uh, and for, for, for the general public, that, that the, you know, the, the, the vision of where we might be had, had, has evolved. And so, and in particular to convey both the exquisite level in which we, there are many things in, in the very small and the very large, which we understand. And at the same time that we have big questions, some of which we have realistic hopes to answer with experiments, some of which will be the subjects of speculation for a long time, if, if not indefinitely. Uh, so that was kind of the motivation. Uh, I, uh, so I wrote a proposal I sent it to a well-known agent who had worked with friends of mine who didn't like it. I, uh, so that was my first experience of this sort. And I, 
sat down at Santa, Santa Cruz has a wonderful program, UC Santa Cruz, uh, for training journalists for uh, as science writers, science journalists. And the director was a friend of mine. I took him out for coffee uh, and he educated me a little bit. I, it's almost too embarrassing to say the, embar the, the, the things he had to explain to me. Was this, was this Rob Erian? Yes. Yeah, sure. I know Rob. So, uh, and, uh, it, but that coffee kind of helped reorient my thinking. But then I also, uh, when I was in Princeton a bit later, about a year or so later, uh, giving some lectures, I went to dinner with some friends in, uh, and I met an author, Graham Farmerlow, who's the author actually of uh, at least three wonderful books. Uh, one, a biography of Paul Dirac, uh, one of the originators of, of quantum mechanics. Uh, the book is entitled The Strangest Man and he was a strange and interesting man. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, uh, he has a book on the uh, British nu uh, nuclear weapons program in the Second World War, and a book more recently uh, called The Universe Speaks in Numbers. In any case, mm -hmm. so I advertise him because he did so much for me. Uh, so he, so we got to know each other. He, we, he discussed my proposal with me. He helped me sharpen it up. Uh, he eventually introduced me to his agent, who was wonderful, who, uh, who then who helped me sharpen up the proposal further and gave me a lot of advice on the, on, on writing. So so this was a process. I should say I, I read Graham Farmelow's book because I had given been given it as a gift by my youngest daughter's math teacher when she was in high school, and I'd read it with some fascination. So uh, so so lots of stories there. So so it's it's it it's it certainly it's certainly been been a process. Uh, and uh, certainly writing, writing in this way has been uh, a, 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 I've done so certainly a, a certain amount of, of writing of short popular pieces and, of, and, and, and certainly done a certain amount of public speaking. But, but, but this, as you know, is, uh, it, it, it is, is quite a different world. And the balance, the trying to achieve a balance between giving honest and, and and meaningful explanations, and not putting everybody to sleep, uh, is 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 a challenge which which I hope I've met. Well, I from what I've read of your book, it seems like you did meet it. Um, Thank you. But let's talk a little bit more about Dirac. Actually, he is an interesting guy, and he yeah. shows up in your book. Um, so he he developed um, the first real quantum field theory, didn't he? Well, not so much that, but he did, he did several remarkable things. So, uh, so one thing he did was he, he gave what, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the mid 1920s, there were sort of two competing views of what quantum mechanics was. Now, this you perhaps touch on in your book. The, there was uh, Schrodinger's equation, this famous equation, with, and then Heisenberg had a different way of formulating quantum mechanics, uh, where he tried to phrase things in terms of measurable quantities, things you could measure. And this was known as matrix mechanics. And Dirac unified this whole thing. He explained what the connections were between these two and he gave us a, a, a framework in which we, in which we uh, not so much in the way we interpret quantum mechanics, but the way in which we just do it, the way in which we calculate things and so on. Uh, but then he did other remarkable things. So one of the things he did is he, 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 he after this, he said, uh, how do I reconcile Einstein's principles of relativity, special relativity, this is, the, the things that said, for example, nothing moves faster than the speed of light. How do I reconcile that with, uh, the equations of Schrodinger or Heisenberg. And he wrote down an equation for, a, for an electron which obeyed the rules of relativity. And it was a remarkable guess, sort of really out of the blue. He, he you know, almost mildly crazy. Uh, but and then he ran into another problem, which he resolved by making an amazing prediction, which was the prediction of antimatter. So he had a feature of his, this, of his, when he solved the equation, there was something that didn't at first sight make sense. When he fixed it, 
he's predicted suddenly this other particle predicted that the electron would be accompanied by another particle of exactly the same mass and the opposite charge. And that these two particles, if they met, could annihilate. So the electron and what's called the positron, if they met, can annihilate, producing, for example, two or three photons. Uh, and that particle was discovered also remarkably almost immediately afterwards uh, in cosmic rays, this, ray, this radiation that comes from space. Uh, and, uh, and actually the discoverer, uh, the physicist named Anderson, was actually very irritated that he made this discovery after the prediction. He was not a fan of theorists, and he didn't like the idea that he discovered something the theory would be predicted. And he made a big point of saying that he was, he was vaguely aware of it, but the mathematics was, it wasn't something people took seriously. But anyway, the, uh, and then Dirac was enga engaged in some very important speculations. So one of them, one of them which is very, which is very beautiful and interesting, uh, is related to a, a puzzle in physics. Again, it's related to those things in the back of the book. Uh, the electron and the proton have exactly opposite electric charges. Why in the world is that? You know, again, did someone just adjust the dial? Right? And this, I should say, is a, an example of the kind of explanations that we're groping for. So what, what Dirac realized really remarkably, using now what were the, you know, sort of the new rules of quantum mechanics, was that if there was a particle which carried magnetic charge, and I should say that's something we, the, the magnets we have, in, the little atoms are like little magnets, electrons are little magnets, but they don't carry a magnetic charge. They're like two magnetic charges of opposite signs separated by a little bit, They're called magnetic dipoles. And, but he said if there was a magnetic, a particle with a magnetic charge, what's called a magnetic monopole. So something that was only north or south. Only north or south. That this would explain this fact that the charges of the electron and the proton are exactly equal. And he did that in the early 1930s uh, in, in a paper that actually begins with a kind of mathematic, with a manifesto about the importance of mathematics in physics. And then, uh, and, and, and the search has been on for a long time and uh, we haven't found one, but almost any time we come up with any alternative explanation, and this includes things called grand unified theories and string theory, the mon monopoles are also lurking there. So, so, so he was onto something. And, uh, and again, this is a mode of explanation that, uh, that intrigues, uh, intrigues us for this problem and for other problems as well. So tell me more about that. Like, is, is, that, is that the sort of thing that you were hoping to convey with your book that the, the kind of, the kinds of explanation, the modes of explanation that we use? Cer it? Certainly some of that. I mean, I mean, the flip side of that is we haven't found molecules and people have believed. <laughs> so now there are good reasons to think there aren't very many. In fact, you know, uh, you know as, as, as you're surely aware, there's this idea uh, that the universe went through a period of very rapid expansion early on. Early on means in a first tiny fraction of a second of the universe, right after the Big Bang. Uh, and this is known as, this period is known as inflation. And one of the things that inflation was in, actually sort of invented to do was to explain why we don't see monopoles. So otherwise, uh, you, know, there was, it was, you know, we had theories which predicted monopoles predicted, and predicted that uh, in the early universe you should produce a lot of them. And astrophysicists can, can assure you that there just aren't many in the universe. And one of the things inflation does is explain that. It's explain that fact. And of course, you might say, well, that's, you know, you know we're, we're trying to find excuses for things, but in fact, Inflation explains other questions as well, uh, and is and we have a great deal of evidence now that something like that happened. Though in detail, we don't know what it was. Uh, so, um, so, 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 I so I haven't really expected anyone to see a monopole. Uh, there are occasionally through the years. Really, it's been a long time, but there occasionally have been claims to see, to see them. 
And people have certainly done a lot of looking. People looked in, in the days of the, in the early, in the early days, the earlier incarnation of the space program, people looked for them in moon rocks. Uh, people looked for them in, they allowed developed all kinds of techniques to look for very, for, uh, for them. Uh, and, and, and there were occasionally excitement about possible discoveries, which turned out not to be, which were not verified. So, uh, so, so this is an idea which, is, if it's to be established, will probably be established not in itself, not by the discovery of a monopole, but by the discovery of some other structure of which monopoles would be a consequence. So something like the so-called grand unified theories, which have their own signature, which I, which I talk about a little bit. So tell me more about what you hope to see in the future. What are, what are you hoping is coming down the line? What's, what's exciting about the prospects for theoretical physics? Okay, well, well I, would, I, I would probably I would divide this up into, into various categories. So there are questions which are things we might hope to, to do with experiment. And there are things where we just have big theoretical puzzles for which we don't have a, a sensible strategy to, to think about them. So in the first case, in the first set, in the experimental case, I, what I would, what I think we have a realistic hope for over the next decade or so is identifying the dark matter, figuring out what it is. For, uh, uh, on a longer time scale, I actually, in fact, I, I sort of give some discussion, of, some explanation for this view in the book. I haven't given up on supersymmetry, but I have given up on the idea that the LHC can, is likely to see it. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I think we really, if it's there, we have some ideas where it is. It's, it's, and, and, and certainly thinking about whether facilities of the future are capable, and this means now, we're talking about things that are more than a decade into the future, uh, but might well have access. So, so that's another example. The dark, the dark energy, which I, which I also talk about a good deal in the book, uh, is something which we've already established a great deal about, we will know more. So, so these are things that we'll understand. Now, the, uh, on a more, well, I should say one more thing, which I hope, hopes for, but I, it's not guaranteed, is that we might get some insight, some experimental evidence for, or observational evidence, for what underlies inflation. And, that, and in particular, we might learn, there's some hope we could learn what, when this occurred, exactly when after the Big Bang. This is equivalent to the question of how much energy is involved in this, in this, in this process. And this, with a little luck, we might get to know that. So flipping to the more theoretical side, I could start there and could say that I, I have hopes that we will have some more compelling theory of inflation, okay? And they say at the moment we don't, uh, but that that's something we could see on the time scale of a decade or so. Okay? And certainly there are ideas, interesting ideas around there, there, there are possibilities there. Then there are a whole range of other theoretical questions and uh, it's all the extremes. So extremely small or the extremely large, uh, which, uh, which, which I, I think we will see progress on. So I, I talk a good deal about the, the, the sort of tension between general relativity and quantum mechanics. Uh, I think that's teaching us a lot. It's pointed us to string theory, but we have a lot of confusions about string theory. Whether the theory as we understand it is really the right theory of quantum gravity is not something we know and exactly in the many aspects of this theory whose very nature we don't know. And I think we'll see progress on this. Uh, I think we'll see progress on understanding uh, better where the laws of nature come from. I think we might see progress on understanding why, uh, why the, there's the amount of dark energy there is. Actually, I'm sorry, I got slightly off the, off the track I was starting to say that for supersymmetry, uh, the uh, a, a question, uh, or I have some arguments why supersymmetry. Another argument beyond this argument of the value of the Higgs mass uh, that the people invoke 
And this has to do with why our universe is stable. And I talk about this a little bit in the book. Uh, it's related to, wonder, to a, a wonderful set of questions related to the ultimate fate of our universe. Uh, there's a, 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 a lovely book, The End of Everything by Katie Mack, which you may be aware of, which talks about some of this. And actually I first heard about this question from a colleague, an astronomy colleague of mine at Santa Cruz uh, some years ago. Uh, but, uh, but one of the possibilities is that our universe as a whole is unstable, is radioactive that it undergoes radioactive decay. And in fact, within the framework of our present ideas, it's really pretty hard to understand why our universe isn't. And one of the few, and I'm not gonna have time to, to explain it here, so I, again, I'll send people to my book, but, uh, but one of the few robust explanations of this stability, the fact that the universe is not, doesn't live a microscopic amount of time, the time it takes light to go across a nucleus, but instead lives, lives tens of billions of, of, or many more years. Uh, about the only robust explanation we have for that is this symmetry called supersymmetry. And I explained that a little bit in the book. So that's got me, uh, uh, not one of the things that has me not total, totally despairing. Uh, it is, whether we can build a facility which would have the energy to discover supersymmetry uh, at the scale, at the scales of energies that the, that the Higgs boson mass suggests, uh, that's an interesting, an interesting question. It's, and one of the things that I, I certainly am thinking about. Great. Yeah, and uh, and just to reiterate what you were saying, I am familiar with Katie's book, uh, The End of Everything, and it's a great book. Yeah. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, uh, we are at the point here where it's time to take questions from the audience. Um, and yeah, I'm not, yeah, I believe that's correct. Um, so I'm gonna take the first audience question here, which follows up on something that you were just talking about. Um, can you give a brief overview of what string theory is? Yes, and, uh, uh, and I will, uh, and again, I'll refer you to my book, which also devotes a, a good little effort to trying to explain this. So, um, so string theory is, 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 or I should say the answer is sort of yes and no, because it's, in some ways it's so weird that it takes a little explaining. And uh, it's, it's not, um, how should I say? When Einstein wrote down his theory of general relativity, his theory of his relativistic theory of gravity, he laid out some broad principles. Then he spent a, the better part of a decade implementing them, figuring out what a theory would have to do to implement these principles. But there was a grand picture of how this worked. String theory is almost exactly the opposite. String theory, it really starts with, well, it, historically it's even weirder, but I'll start with the idea that the basic entities in, in nature are not point particles, very tiny things like the electron, but extended objects, little, little strings. Okay. And what's remarkable and what I as I describe in the book is, you know, if you gave the, pro the following problem to a, a good graduate student, you said, okay, Imagine the, the, the basic entities are strings, write down a theory of those objects, which is consistent with the rules of quantum mechanics and the rules of special relativity. And all sorts of weird things would happen. So I'm assuming this is, this, this is a good student. I should say why, why, why one of the things I try and explain in the book is there are different notions of hard. So this is a hard problem, but people can do it in a finite amount of time sitting around and thinking, you know, not, you know, you need some training, but it's not, it, you know, and then there are hard problems that are, you know, give me a, give me a universe sized computer and I still can't solve it. Okay. So, um, so there are different classes of hard problems. So this is a, 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 a tough problem for a graduate student, but they can come back in a few weeks with the answer. And the, uh, and what this person discovers writing down this, doing this sim most simple minded extension of sort of the simple theories that we have now is that this theory is a theory of general relativity and of the standard model. Okay, so it has all of that. So it has these features. Okay, 
it took a, a time to sort this out and exactly why this happens is still not really clear. It's not like this grandiose vision of Einstein that we have these rules and everything follows. It's instead, we, 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 we have the follows and we don't know what the grandiose picture really is. That's sort of part of the problem. But this theory does make, uh, it, it, it does make uh, not exactly predictions, I have to be a little careful here, but it does exhibit structures very much like the structures we see in nature. Not exactly, or at least we don't understand how to make those correspondences exact. And that's why the theory is not, that's why this theory generates so much angst and criticism and, and discussion, because really making a detailed picture of how, these, how this theory relates to nature uh, is, is, is tough. It's a tough problem for, uh, in this sense, in this hard sense that I described. And, and I explain a little bit in the book just why it's a hard problem what the obstacles are. Great. Okay, so another question from the audience uh, that, that might be a good follow-up to that one. Um, can we explain the apparent fine tuning of the fundamental constants, including the electron mass that has given rise to an interesting universe? Ah, okay, well, this is also, this, this is related. I mentioned the Higgs mm -hmm. mass, and this is an example. This is one of the dramatic examples. I, it's one of the few equations I write in the book just to illustrate what I, what's meant by this tuning. So basically I talked about how the fact that the fields of the fields uh, surrounding Higgs, in this case, the fields of, the, of these weakly interacting analogs of the photon are carry energy. And to make that energy balance out to what we see, you have to, as if say fine tune. So fine tuning is a notion you have to be my age to, to remember radios with knobs uh, and where you had to, uh, and, and, and where if you were trying oh, to- I remember those signal, radios too. <laughs> if, you, if you were trying to pick up a weak signal, you had to adjust just very precisely. So this mm -hmm. is an absurd level of precision. Uh, I, in fact, I tell a story in this book. I first learned, heard of this problem in a seminar by a, a then very young Leonard Susskind when I was a graduate student. And I should say, I mean, I'm sure your experience is similar uh, as a graduate student, but through most of life, but certainly as a graduate student, but most of the time you go to seminars, you're rather lost. And, uh, and certainly you don't remember them very well. <laughs> and I remember this, this, I don't want to know, this seminar was uh, more than 40 years ago. Uh, and I remember it, uh, you know, like it was yesterday, because he first illustrated this problem and just how severe it was. And he made a proposal. He had a proposal, uh, which uh, which was another for how you might solve it. That was known as Technicolor, and that's a whole other story. Uh, but um, uh, but 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 this 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 is uh, one of the most severe problems. Actually, there's a more severe one, which is the dark energy. So the dark energy is so so. If you like the the dark matter. It, the Higgs boson mass is tuned, for, for, forgive my using uh, scientific notation, but is tuned to about a part in 10 to the 30 or more. The dark matter is turned, the dark energy rather, is tuned to a part in something like 10 to the 120, at least naively. So, so, it's, pretty, so it's pretty nutty. So the it's a, a one with 120 zeros after it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, 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 or, or put it another way, it means that you have to write out the basic number is something like one with 120 zeros. There's another number which sort of contributes to that, which is another one with another 120 digits. Okay. And the digits all match except in that last spot. <laughs> okay. So that's, so, so that's the fine tuning problem. Uh, the electron mass, as I said, is in some sense not fine to. This question is a good one. It sort of takes us into wh why this might be. So, we, so, so, so some possible explanations for the Higgs case, for example, I mentioned supersymmetry and I mentioned this idea of Susskind's and also Steven Weinberg's of Technicolor. Uh, the, uh, but uh, 
And again, Technicolor, you again probably have to be of a certain age. So Technicolor was one of the first processes for producing color movies, movies in color rather than black and white. And it was a, it was, it was a trade name. And actually at the time when, when uh, Susskind wrote his paper, the physical review uh, insisted that it, that it change the name for fear of trademark violation. <laughs> so, uh, but we are, um, but, but this takes us into, into these kind of questions. So, so as I say, supersymmetry, technicolor, these were offered, uh, but, uh, but the, the most severe of these tunings, this dark ener energy uh, tuning, uh, really no one has offered a symmetry explanation for it. And in fact, the only really, ec really decent explanation we have is this so-called anthropic principle. Okay, which is again, which causes a great deal of angst, uh, but also actually was considered prior to the discovery of the dark energy and got it roughly right. So people often complain it's unscientific, but it actually made a prediction. <laughs> Just for the people who might not know in the audience, can you explain what you mean when you say anthropic principle? Ah, this is, okay. So- uh, Just briefly, so we can get to yeah, one more absolutely, question. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, so, so uh, I can frame it the following way. So sometimes it's said that, uh, that nature is the way it is so people can be here to observe it. That's a kind of extreme version of it. Uh, a real version of it is if you could say, uh, you know, fish find themselves in water. Water is very special. We, we live in a big universe, only a tiny bit of it is water. Why do fish find themselves in water? Well, fish are in water because that's the only place they can survive. So that happened. So what Steven Weinberg first pointed out about the dark energy is that if the dark energy were much larger than it has turned out to be, you couldn't form stars, planets, uh, never mind people. Uh, now the problem with the anthropic principle, so this, this, so this he actually, he, he, he actually in, his, in a beautiful paper uh, distinguish various versions of this, and this is called the weak anthropic principle. So just some minimal requirement for our existence, not a detailed requirement. The problem is when you open that Pandora's box, you worry that you might have explain other phenomena this way. So for example, if the Higgs mass were much heavier, were, if the Higgs were much heavier than it is, there are all sorts of problems with creating stars, for example, and other things. Is that the explanation? So this is an, an area that causes a lot of angst, I will say, both for those who adopt this or consider seriously this, this point of view and for those who attack it. So we only have time for one or two more questions. I'm going to ask another audience question, which is sure. a sort of follow-up to what you were just saying about the anthropic principle. And if you can answer it quickly, then maybe we'll have time for one more after that. Okay, I'll try. Um, any comments about the multiverse, which I know is related to the anthropic principle? Yeah, I, well, um, uh, only basically that the multiverse is the setting for this anthropic principle. The notion that there are, uh, that, uh, that the way I sort of describe it in the book is that imagine the universe is really much larger that, than we see and that we have some Star Trek-like creatures that can explore it. Okay, what do they see as they travel around? And the picture is they, they, as they move around on the scale, scales larger than our, the universe we observe, they see different laws of nature. They see, so many of these universes, they see nothing like, nothing that's hospitable to, to life. And then occasionally they do. And that's kind of where this multiverse is. It, 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 it raises many puzzles and problems, theoretically. Uh, and, and certainly questions about whether you could ever find any evidence. There, there are some ideas about how you might, uh, but, but it's, a tough, it's, it's a tough problem and it's an area that a lot of people would prefer we all stay away from. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna ask one more audience question and that's gonna have to be the last one. And, and it's sort of related to what you were just saying. Um, um, for things that, uh, and it's also related to something you were saying earlier, 
Um, for questions that can't be answered experimentally, uh, I'm curious how you think about such things, um, you know, from the perspective of, uh, you know, what the scientific method is and how we could know that those things are true. That's an excellent question. And I don't have a simple pat answer. So in some cases, so I would go back. In some cases, we may know things indirectly. So for example, I would go back to the story of the magnetic monopole. So there are theories which predict, which explain this, what's called the quantization of charge, this fact that this exact equality of certain electric charges. Okay. Uh, they almost inevitably predict magnetic monopoles. Odds are pretty good we will never see a magnetic monopole that maybe there's one, if inflation is right, there might be just one in the whole universe. We'd have, you know, at, at best. Uh, so it's quite, but, but these theories make other predictions, uh, which might be verified and tested. So in particular, I mentioned brand unified theories. This is also true of string theory. They predict at some level that matter, all matter is radioactive, that the proton in particular decays with some very long half-life. Okay, so eventually we will all, we'll all, we'll all decay. Uh, this is a subject of active experimental search. Uh, if one were to discover proton decay and some evidence for some of these theories, one would have good reason to think that the magnetic monopoles are also there. So that I would say is a kind of model or paradigm for how we might answer some questions that trouble us without having maybe the most direct experimental evidence we might like. I should say that some things are less, so that's a, a kind of nice case, of course, there, there, there's plenty of, there are plenty of instances where we're speculating beyond uh, having the, you know, realistic hope. Of, of, and so, and, and, and I think we will have to decide as a, as a species to what degree we're satisfied with certain kinds of explanations. I should say at the moment though, even, even theoretical things without experiment are tough. For the questions that I, that I list in the book and some of the ones I've listed here, uh, we, don't, we, we don't have explanations, candidate explanations that are particularly compelling. Uh, and uh, so, so, so it may well be in some cases, some explanation which is sufficiently tight uh, might, might be, might, might be might become compelling great well um i think we're out of time uh and i think that's a great place to leave it um so uh our thanks to michael dine uh author of this way to the universe a theoretical physicist's journey to the edge of reality uh okay. and yeah sorry and thanks to you <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, this was fun. fascinating. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Um, uh, so we encourage all of you to pick up a copy of Professor Dine's book at your local bookstore. Uh, and if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's effort, efforts in making in-person and virtual programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org events. I'm Adam Becker. Thank you and take care.